uh, it's okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I have the pleasure to moderate this uh, panel uh, session. So what would be a workshop without a nice panel? And um, uh, as we, as you can see, we have uh, four uh, panelists uh, from uh, diverse, uh, coming from uh, diverse backgrounds, such that we have a nice covering of the uh, different perspectives. So we have. Um, uh, Andre Pitish, who is yeah a technologist, entrepreneur, mentor, and so on and so forth. So I guess most of you uh, know him. Then we have uh, Grigore, who spoke uh, this morning from a yeah uh, academic but also also entrepreneurial viewpoint of uh, blockchain. Uh, then we have uh, Marius, who is uh, at the uh, yeah out uh, services company also having pro projects in blockchain, but also others, and also uh, Andre, who uh, they, uh, they have a, a, a product. So it's kind of, again, a, a different uh, perspective. So um, the plan is to, to have a round of uh, introductions and then uh, move to, uh, as the title says, to the challenges from their perspective. And I would suggest then to, uh, from the uh, personal or company perspective to the community perspective, because we are here together in a community. And then again, to the opportunities that we may see uh, personally, but also from the, our uh, community point of view. And then of course, we are open to discussions. So uh, I give uh, now the uh, floor to Andy. Uh, uh, th thank you very much. Uh, okay. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Uh, sorry. So there's a lot of people online. Okay. Yes. Cool. So in, in this, uh, in this, uh, with this gentleman next to me, I'm also known as Andy. This is my name uh, from when I was little, and we're colleagues in. Um, in general school now uh, now everybody knows me as, as andre so uh, i am yes and like yeah so that's that's true and I, i'm thinking you know maybe i maybe, maybe i'll go back to andy i mean i think uh, <laughs> it sounds way cooler than andre uh, uh the, I, I met a lot of andre in in my life very few andy so uh, <laughs> i think it would be a better uh, handle if you want um I don't know a lot of people here, and this is great because uh, lately I've uh, spoken to communities that I know, and uh, you know, I ran out of things to tell them. Uh, and uh, <laughs> and um, I, I'm not a professor anymore, so I cannot repeat <laughs> uh, so 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 much. Um, I, I used to teach uh, operating systems at Polytechnica, so uh, not at uh, informatics. I'm a programmer actually, uh, and an entrepreneur. And uh, looking forward to, to your questions, I think, right? I mean, uh, is this going to be more of a question or what, what is the format? I mean, so, so the plan is after a quick introduction, just uh, talking about the challenges in the blockchain. Each of us, Each of us one challenge in from your okay. personal so finish, perspective. So, to finish the introduction, uh, in the, the blockchain area, let's say I'm an advisor for uh, uh, Multiversic slash Elrond uh, since uh, pro probably the beginning uh, for BUR Labs. Uh, and uh, we've just organized the hackathon a couple of uh, weekends ago where Runtime Verification was also a partner uh, to entice young people to build and to imagine the future to build, you know, things. It doesn't have to be businesses, so it's not an entrepreneurial thing. To, to imagine a solution that's built using uh, uh, Genesio, that's the technology that we are now developing, uh, using blockchain. Uh, using uh, you know BWR labs and the multiversics and you know and also challenges from uh, other partners uh, in order to uh, get a glimpse at the future i mean nobody knows what the future looks like and i think the best glimpse that we can get at the future is through the eyes of the people that are creating it so you know uh, and oftentimes this that these are programmers or like scientists or like who are imagining the future before it actually happens in business or in real life 
So this is my introduction. So. I'm Grigore Roshu. I'm an academic. I'm a professor at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Also an entrepreneur, the CEO of Runtime Verification. I founded the company in 2010. <clears throat> and um, also an investor, not as big as Andy here, but uh, trying to do my best and uh, getting wrecked here and there <laughs> in, the, in the usual uh, style. And I'm very interested in uh, program correctness and in correctness in general. What does it mean for something to be correct um, and when it is worth going for it? I'm also interested in um, the next generation, making sure they get educated, they understand the problems, the challenges, and they have the background to, to fight the beast, which is all the complexity that is everywhere, including in blockchains, especially in blockchains. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I'm Marius. I'm CTO of Subinator. Um, I'm a builder at heart. I, I'm not a big investor or neither a, an academic. Uh, I like to build stuff. Why I'm blockchain and why I'm here? Because uh, I I do like every like big innovation. I think the Nakamoto consensus is one of the let's say our uh, era uh, innovation, and based on that we have this technology that is awesome i'm looking forward to the future future uh, on the blockchain space uh, especially from the eyes of a builder so everyone who builds uh it's needs to be like on a um, needs to understand that it's important to not give up and it, uh, even if the technology is not quite there you should keep building because you are the one who basically help getting the technology where it should be. And I think that's all. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm Andre Marnica. I'm a core team member at uh, Multiverse X. Um, I got into Multiverse X, I think, more than four years ago. Uh, for me, it was initially uh, more like an excuse uh, to, I wanted to get into formal stuff in modeling. <laughs> and uh, blockchain seemed like a good excuse for it, but uh, I ended up loving the technology and I still do. Um, and what I do, uh, I see myself as a person who builds languages and tools for developers. Like, I, I, I didn't yet build a language for scratch, from scratch, because there's not kind of, there's not the point, but I, I see language, in, I talk about language in a very broad sense. Every time a developer creates something, you know, is using some sort of language, or even a, when a user, you know, works with an app, there's an implicit language there. Uh, and I think it, especially since blockchain is so tied together to um, truth, uh, to society, to how people communicate and how value arises, very important that we are very precise about the language and uh, that, that those tools are very powerful. And there were a lot of, uh, very difficult technical tasks, even like launching our blockchain was a tremendously difficult task and we're very, very proud of that it went so well and it's still working after two years and never had downtime and all that. Um, but what I've noticed is that it's not enough to have the best tech out there, uh, especially, especially on blockchain, which is such a social technology. It's so much about people coming together. Uh, so what you need is also a way to get go get to people, uh, and you usually do that through products like we have Exportal, which is a web app. Uh, that's probably how most people discovered Multiverse X, uh, and we want to do more stuff like that. We want to make blockchain and Web three available for everyday people, and it's not easy because there's a language barrier because new technology, even for us, it's sometimes difficult to understand. And yeah, so that's sort of my job is to get the technology out to people. So. Thank you very much. So uh, we move to this uh, part uh, that we um, discussed about challenges because a good story, uh, not to be boring, you, the hero needs to face some uh, hard times and then to uh, succeed. So uh, what are your personal uh, challenges? You already mentioned uh, like complexity of uh, these systems or people or skills and so on. So what are your uh, a couple of problems or challenges that you that you encounter during your in blockchain of course of course we are talking about blockchain or blockers in blockchain if you go first then i'll run out of things to say so 
Uh, no, no. Uh, I I want to. I mean, one of the things is what uh, Andre was saying. Uh, the fact that uh, it's it's a new language, and not in the sense of programming language, but a new new language of you know talking about things. So uh, we have to get our heads around it, and uh, so that that explains a little bit why uh, people are still trying to figure out uh, some of the applications. So some some of them are more clear now than they were like years ago, but some others are not yet. Uh, and I think there's a lot of experimentation, and I think that uh, the solution to that is to offer uh, a safe, you know, safe space for experimentation uh, to, to people. Uh, and that's what the Wikileaks Hackathon wanted to be and to become actually a safe space for people to experiment. Uh, but I'd also like to, you know, talk about uh, some of the uh, problems that uh, blockchain is facing with, uh, with regulators. And the fact that I think the biggest hurdle is the fact that the regulators don't understand anything what's happening and they're trying to regulate something that they don't really understand. And on the other side uh, of the, you know, of the wall, there's a lot of people who, who, you know, don't want regulations uh, on one hand and also they don't know how to speak to the regulators in order to explain them what to regulate. And I think that this is a, a still a big, uh, uh, still a big blocker of uh, adoption everywhere. And uh, yeah, I don't know if we can, I mean, because we, you know, we, are, we are technologists, but I think that uh, the more we think with a broader, broader hat and the more we think of, a, of a, the general view and how that can uh, fit into the future, because regulations, you know, in the state and the laws and the regulations always follow innovation. There is always, for any startup, I mean, I, I, I mean startups since forever, and any startup that I've started, violated a few laws when it was launched anything like i i, I was the founder of vector watch and uh, uh and so i i created a, a smartwatch uh, from romania that violated it initially like a few romanian laws because you, you cannot send money to china uh without any contract i'm like yeah but otherwise the factory in china would not open the door if i don't pay them an advance yeah what is the advance for to open the door and to be able to do something there you need papers, you need proof, you need, and like, you know, so it was already illegal. So I had to change the entity that is doing watches in UK where it's not illegal, you know, but then how to, to exchange money between Romania and the, the UK entity. That's illegal again, I mean, you have to, so everything that you're doing and there's something that has never been done before, like a smartwatch in Romania, uh, violates a few laws from the moment it's born. So also, you know, blockchain violates a lot of laws because it's something new that violates everywhere, you know. So, however, I try to understand what, you know, what laws we're violating in order to, um, and I mean, I'm hoping that, so this is recorded, but it's not really posted somewhere. <laughs> it's not like, I mean, there's not newspaper people in the, Yeah. So uh, yeah, I'm always. <laughs> I mean, every everything that's new, any innovation violates laws. So that's something that I can stand uh, uh, up to. So. All right, challenges. Um, yes, there are all these challenges with regulators, and, uh, and but let let me let me mention a challenge that um, that I was surprised initially that that even exists, but um, I realized that actually could be one of the biggest, which is the education of masses of people, right? So we get used to what we do to use a hardware wallet. For example, to me, it looks a lot easier to use a hardware wallet and sign a transaction instead of typing a username and a password to get into my bank account. That sounds looks so stupid so silly now <laughs> you know um, why it's faster actually to use a hardware wallet right but uh, normal users they got used with the old ways of doing things and um, and um, yeah so each time i talk to non-technologists right they say why it is so difficult why it is so hard to use i like to use it but it's difficult it's hard but it's not, I'm telling them, look, how long it takes you to get into your account? You have to use 2FA and all that stuff. You don't have the phone or whatever, right? And I get immediately into my wallet and I see exactly what I have. I can do a transaction right away. 
I don't have to wait two days for the bank to do a wire transfer and pay fifteen dollars plus another twenty five for the receivable, right? And um, it's instantaneous. But um, I think people are learning, but it takes a while. And uh, I started to appreciate people who put their energy and life into educating others on how to use uh, the blockchain. I think, you know, for mass adoption, we we need that. Right? As technologists, we understand quickly how to use things. But, um, you know, many, many, many people have a hard time to do that. So that would be on, on the education side. And then on the, technolo on the technological side, uh, one problem that we face regularly when we talk to our uh, clients, developers of smart contracts, is that they don't understand the importance of um, not auditing in general, but of correctness, of security, right? They are too excited to get things done quickly and make them public, uh, make money quickly or lose money <laughs> even quicker. Um, instead of, you know, taking the due diligence to, you know, to audit <laughs> or analyze the, their code in depth. Um, I was telling in uh, in uh, Marius' talk that um, one thing which surprised me when I when I when I joined NASA in two thousand was to see that only twenty percent of the budget of a project went into the actual code development. So eighty percent went into validation VNV. That's how they call it, validation and verification, which included testing, writing specifications, verifying code and uh, and that code is not even tempered with right they put it in a spacecraft and that flies forever there right there are no aliens um, attacking it or submitting transactions on the, <laughs> on the bus on the bus in the spacecraft right so i think i think you know uh, actually on the blockchain if you if you are very very serious about the security of your application you should spend like 90% of the budget of a project on vmv and only 10% on writing the code Actually, with some of the, our clients, we tell them that, hey, you know, it takes us, you're not ready for an audit with us because it would take us longer to explain you how to write your code, you know, than to just write it ourselves. And, uh, but we don't do that. Um, so anyway, so maybe it's not also education, but education for developers that they need to take security and correctness very seriously. So yeah, I think these are the challenges that I have. Um, I'll try to list some challenges for you as well to say, so we don't cover <laughs> all the challenges. Uh, uh, what, well, from a builder point of view, one of the challenges that I have is actually tooling. Uh, it's it's hard to dip, uh, to develop on blockchain because it's a very early uh, technology, and the tooling uh, it's needed. So, please, everyone who builds stuff, please build more tooling for the blockchain as well. Uh, and another challenge is actually um, rock pulls. That's a, not, not, not a good challenge. Yeah, a lot of rock pulls. Like. So if you think, so the blockchain is basically kind of like, uh, it, it, it's a technology, right? The problem with the blockchain is that you have some assets that are actually valuable. So because those assets, are valuable you have a lot of people that want those assets right exploiters wh white hats black hats whatever right and those rug pulls and the exploiters that are actually in the field discourage a lot of people to enter and to actually build more right um, it's a challenge that i don't have a solution it's a challenge that i mean it, I, I don't see how we can solve it uh, because uh, everything that basically it's um, ha everything that has a value can will, will always be exploited or try to be exploited by someone. Um, it's a challenge that I'm fighting and I, we, are, we are fighting day by day. We're trying to we with white hatted uh, for some funds uh, before in the nomad uh, in, uh, in the nomad hack and we gave the funds back. 
uh, we tried to white hat a big Euler's uh, uh, exploit, but unfortunately it was too quick for us. And Euler's architecture was quite, quite nast nasty to actually see from the beginning uh, where the bug was. So yeah, it's a challenge that it's hard to, to, to face. Uh, and it's a challenge that makes people to unfortunately uh, break down mentally. And it's a challenge that made people uh, take their lives because they lose money. Uh, and that's a channel that kind of no one speaks. And it's a channel that I've been into for like the, from 2020 till today. Uh, and uh, it's a channel that, uh, yeah, you should be aware. And you should, even if you have that saying that don't, don't put more money that you can lose, everyone puts a lot of money that they cannot lose, but they all put it there. So yeah, it's a channel that uh, currently in blockchain, it, uh, we, are still, we are still facing. Not sure how we can solve it, but hopefully we can solve it at some point. Thank you. Um, yeah, so as challenges for me personally is to manage my time because there's so much to do. <laughs> but jokes aside, uh, yeah, uh, a lot of a lot of great challenges we've been talking about. Um, I don't know what I, I'll start with the engineering challenge. Um, I think I don't think it's a actually a problem that's specific to blockchain it's more like we've always had this problem and blockchain has only exacerbated it uh the move fast and break things mentality because we're all lazy and we want to get uh stuff done fast uh we've had it since like forever uh people won't write tests unless somebody forces them to and um people don't take security seriously until something bad happens and sometimes not even then uh and i think I found in blockchain like a space where these kind of ideas, while they are fringe everywhere else, have become center stage. Like, how do you trust stuff? Uh, we don't ask ourselves about trust on the most software that we use. Whenever you install an app on your phone, you don't think a lot about trust, although you probably should. Um, and the same for a bank. Uh, if a bank gets hacked and stuff like that, you have sort of like, the expectancy that you know the government will step in or someone so the police will get your money back uh, but we're not used mentally to dealing with this kind of trustless environment where you're responsible with your responsibility and i had this feeling first time i i don't know first time i bought some tokens i was like uh crushed by this sense of responsibility oh my god if if i lose my keys it's really gone uh you know but also nobody can tamper with it nobody can 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 take it from me um and I think, and it's the same with software, like the way we develop software, you know, uh, the platforms that we use, our own code, we're very easy to trust it because we always feel there's somebody out there who's gonna bail us out or something. Um, yeah, and, and, and blockchain changes these assumptions. And I think it's very difficult for regular people and also for developers to get their head around this and to get the, the feel for it. Uh, for instance, on Multiverse 6, we have this problem, and it's, it's mostly a social problem, I think. It's, it's in the minds of people. Uh, we have a lot of uh, developers that develop projects and write zero tests. And they say they tested it live on the blockchain. And I'm like, yeah, but then you change your code, and you have to test it again. And like, well, ah, whatever. Um, so yeah, the kind of stuff we're trying to do for this is trying to you know take this bitter pill of testing and, and sugarcoat it. Uh, we're trying to write some tools that you know whenever you launch a transaction to the blockchain, maybe you also get a test auto generated. Come on, guys! Come on, guys! Just have some have some regression tests there. Uh, so yeah, I think the biggest the biggest challenge is yeah getting to, to people's mind this idea of, of of responsibility and you know not trusting somebody else. And I think with the rug pulls is the same. It's a problem of the fact that people trust very easily projects just because they sound good. Um, it's very actually it's also a technical problem in, se in the sense that it's very difficult nowadays to tell apart good projects from bad projects. And it's also probably a, we're very lacking in terms of governance. You would probably need a lot of governance for projects to be reasonably trustworthy. And people just ignore that. Um, but I guess in time, this will change. It's going to be a long process. Uh, and I, I also want to address, like, really short, uh, this regulator thing. I feel that um, in the regulation space, the regulations have still not uh, kept uh, 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 have still not uh, kept up with Web 2. So we're still behind with Web 2. We have the GDPR, for instance, which it doesn't do much, really, 
honestly, you know, it was, we still haven't figured out how to regulate Web 2 and Web 3 is so new. And I remember there was a meme, um, there was this frog character calling uh, uh, the, the taxes department. Uh, look, I got rug pulled on an NFT and I bought it for I don't know what kind of shit coin. And can I get reimbursed because I lost a lot of money, you know, uh, and there's nothing on the other end. Uh, so I don't see a solution for that. This is probably going to be a big challenge to getting across regulators, something that even for us developers and, you know, innovators is still difficult to grasp. But I guess we have to be patient and persistent. So, yeah. So if you read the the uh, the tax uh, for uh, for Romanian tax for uh, for crypto, you cannot accrue uh, losses. So so if you have a loss, it's like it was a loss. But if you have gains, you have to pay. The, the only the only good good news is that it's ten percent. But yeah. but you you cannot you cannot you cannot carry you cannot carry any loss. Like it, 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 it is the only asset class that you cannot get any loss. So, which is like horrible. I mean, it's like still you lose money, right? I mean, like how can that be right? I mean, and we're still lucky to have. Okay. And we're still lucky to have some some of the more lax uh, taxing uh, codes in Romania. I hear in place like Germany, they they actually have to you know do a lot more forms. So. I, th I think we're still lucky. Sometimes it can be. Sometimes the ignorance of the regulators can be a blessing in disguise because they won't know how much they could regulate. So, yeah. But we will we'll have to eventually cope with it. I think so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I looked with the accountant over the new tax instructions. And it's uh, yeah, I, there's you cannot you there are the formulas are not there, you know, so they don't say which price to take into account, and like uh, it's like you don't know how to calculate. So it's you know, I mean, I I like to pay all taxes, but how <laughs> much, you know, like so it's like. Okay, thank you very much. So. I think quite a lot of problems, and I would uh, move now to the second part, uh, positive side. So, what opportunities? Uh, again, from a personal point of view, but then uh, really, uh, I would want to take also this community perspective, because here we are in many roles, like builders, innovators, entrepreneurs, investors, academics, education, research, and so on. So, there there are so many hats around. And uh, but we want to uh, move together somehow uh, and synchronize a bit to move things. So yeah, from your perspective, this is this is the I think the biggest uh, the biggest opportunity is the fact that it's a uh, domain that is new, and uh, there's I mean if you you know take away the weed I mean there's a lot of smart people you know like look in this room I mean everybody uh, here and a lot of uh, it it's an it, it's an environment where I I got to meet a lot of very very smart people that's my my take on that uh and aside from that i think uh, uh it is my strong belief that if there's enough smart people together something good will come out, come out of it uh, eventually um and uh, yeah that's the biggest opportunity in my opinion also the opportunity to pay tax i mean i think it generates a lot of tax i mean there's a lot of opportunity yeah and i, I do pay i mean I, i'm a big believer in paying taxes I and mean, we're, we're in a we live in a state and that state i mean you, we don't pay taxes for ourselves like a lot of people think that you know you pay taxes in order to have access to hospitals and to uh, to you know to have pension or to but no i mean you you pay the pension for your grandparents when you pay the tax you pay the hospitals for people who cannot afford to go to a private hospital so this is what tax means i mean and uh, to me uh, if you know if you choose to live in a country where you you know there's taxes there's taxes for many many good reasons i mean i can name a lot of reasons that are not so good right but there's many many good reasons to pay the tax and uh, i think that the gains that can be had in this domain uh, and uh, that uh, in if i was if i was the romanian state i would have made uh, you know everything legal from the very first start and uh, have people pay 10% now the state would be much much richer much richer all right. 
um, <clears throat> for me, a big opportunity in blockchain um, is that I can unfold my agenda <laughs> that everything is a mathematical proof in the end. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think if we had a rigorous way to assess truth, um, we would have a lot less useless infrastructure than in the society. Right, so why do why do we have banks? Because we don't trust each other, because people lie, right? But if you can always say exactly how much money you have, you have 100, okay, fine. I buy a car, I pay 10, now I have 90. And whenever I tell everybody that I have 90, they know that that's true, right? Or maybe I can hide some uh, particular details, but you know, you if, if you tell the truth, you don't need a lot of infrastructure. Um, and I think we'll end up with a much more efficient society overall if we have a way to assess and check uh, truth immediately. And to me, that's what really blockchain is about. The fact that we have cryptocurrencies and money around, yeah, uh, this is a natural application. But I think what really is the main gain and opportunity, in, in my view, is the fact that we have a very rigorous way to assess truth in a way that is checked immediately by, you know, by whoever you want to check it. And uh, you don't have to be too creative to lie <laughs> or anything like that. Um, and um, no intermediaries, right? Of course, that comes at a price currently. It's hard to use, hard to understand, hard to educate. But once it penetrates, the, the masses. I think uh, we live in a different world. And to me, that's really exciting. Besides everything else Sandy said, all the smart people around. But I think the smart people feel it, <laughs> feel it that there is something really deep here. Um, and we don't know exactly if it will be in this shape that we have it now or in some slightly different shape in the future. But you know that there is a big thing going on. Right? We are here for that big thing. <laughs> Yeah, uh, very good points. Uh, I like also that you see that it brings truth and it, it brings also trust in a trustless world. Uh, and using blockchain, basically, you cannot lie. Why? Because uh, basically, math and code is law. I mean, you those are like, of course, if not, quantum computing will be on and everything will be I don't, I don't know, <laughs> uh, broken, so on and so forth. Um, but that's one of the things that I really care. And I think that the blockchain is, a, from a builder point of view, I really like the space because uh, it brings a bit uh, the, the old times where you can have, you need to basically craft everything from scratch. You need to do it from, yeah. So it's a lot of opportunity into building the new things. You, you don't get used with what was built. You need to build. Uh, why? Because it's not built uh, uh, so far. And another important thing is that Every time people are asking me, oh, okay, but uh, you talk about blockchain, talk about blockchain, but what about cryptocurrencies? Cryptocurrency, I don't like to th talk about cryptocurrencies. I, I mean, I, I do invest, I buy, whatever, but I don't like to talk about it. Why? Because I'm not a financial guy, but I do like cryptocurrencies for one purpose. Like they enabled us to have a lot of people put money into research. And with the help of the cryptocurrencies, it helps us to have like you know innovations in homomorphic encryptions, in, in zk, in decentralization, in uh, a lot of stuff, right? Probably blockchain will be just a, I don't know uh, a thing that uh, the gamer was uh, using for them to play in a game. Probably we, we wouldn't talk about that here now but because a Bitcoin that we have actual value and people. Everything that has a value, people want it, of course. Uh, so be because of that, I think it, it helped us to have so much innovation. And yeah, I don't believe in crypto and whatever, but I do believe in the power of money, enabling some smart people to work on some great challenges. There's my kid. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, so about the taxes thing, I didn't mean it's great that we have small taxes. I mean, it's great that it's simple enough to pay them so that people are encouraged to pay them. So <laughs> that's a big that's a big point. We want people to. Yeah, that's it's it's important for everybody to pay their taxes. So I know. Yeah, it's it's cheap. We should pay that tax. <laughs> uh, the problem I have with taxes is usually when they're not thought out 
well and they then they start it's difficult to pay them so people get encouraged to hide their 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 profits so no it, the point is everybody should pay their taxes uh but with that being said uh there's a big um opportunity i think um and not many people talk yet about it uh i think the idea of of simulating organizations actually having organizations that are trustless uh in a space that moves very quickly and where there's very much room for experimentation uh, I think that is something that we're going to see more of in the future, stuff like uh, DAOs uh, or even like small governance protocols, um, seeing and experimenting how people can get together and decide things together. I think that is something that we have not yet seen. And I used to joke, um, yeah, it's a bit of a dark humor, you know, maybe you heard of Iron Finance. It was sort of like a bank and it had a bank run in 10 days. And I, I was thinking, well, where else in the world do you get the full cycle from inception of a bank to bankruptcy so quickly, right? Uh, and I think there's actually great opportunity in this because you can weed out bad ideas very quickly because the space moves so fast. Maybe in the real world, you have a great idea uh, to build a company or maybe a political party or maybe an organization. And maybe it takes years until you figure out that, no, you, you thought it all wrong. Uh, your ideas don't really work in the real world. And actually having them run in this kind of new age of the internet or the web, uh, you can have this idea tried and tested with real people and hopefully not too many losses. So in a very small controlled environment. So I'm not encouraging people to, to forfeit their fortunes, you know, but the idea of, of getting together, voting, uh, deciding stuff, I think is very exciting for me. Um, and the main limitation for this for now is that technology is not yet friendly enough for people to experiment that easily with it. So you need pretty technical people right now to build these kind of things. And, but I'm expecting as we move forward and, um, yeah and make these things more available for people there will be more ideas and more creativity from it and then of course the idea of truth yeah when you, you know with the deep fakes and, and all of that it's becoming harder and harder to know what's real or not um and hopefully we we can you know have this layer of trust of proof um i don't know how many people will resort to blockchain for truth because uh, we already have like fact checkers and stuff like that and it doesn't mean that everybody now is is perfectly well informed uh, but it's still nice that we can add this layer of trust to our society. I think it's going to bring a lot of uh, positive uh, development over the next few years and many years, I hope. So, yeah. Yeah. Those are the best. Those are the best fact checkers. Are those that? Yeah, the automated ones. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Absolutely. <laughs> well, the idea is you shouldn't trust the blockchain. You shouldn't trust anybody, right? So even if it's a Trump chain, as long as it proves things that are correct, it's okay. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, or disproval, maybe sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you very much for the uh, good ideas yeah. so uh, regarding the community because you already mentioned a bit uh, and uh, also some of you i mean many of us uh, have this uh, experience with in different settings like andy with those building teams but also reaching users or people that could use the technology also you with these ecosystems with and so on so I'd, I'd be great to 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 explore a bit this this idea because yeah we have the technology but we have the people or the human who are also a bit messy in a sense also reasoning but uh, yeah we also want to regulate with technology and this ministry of truth or blockchain of truth things uh, but uh, yeah uh, I think it's a nice uh, uh, this borderline between. Uh, I think in terms of uh, communities, communities gather around a um, an idea or you know a set of values. Or, and uh, I've uh, got together with a few uh, a few friends. We've uh, started the Innovation Labs, which is one of the let, let's say you know biggest communities uh, of student entrepreneurs. So it's like a pre accelerator for students, runs for ten years, and in all of the uh, all of the country, uh, five cities and eighteen universities. 
and that that evolved i mean that evolved into a community uh, over the years um and uh, and there i think uh, it's it's you know it about about building something of value for your you know fellow citizens or something so like what an entrepreneur does right um however in that community it was harder to uh, and we try to to have like a blockchain track and it didn't really develop that well so uh, because because the the community was so large and so so diverse they did not have a, a focus on blockchain so it it was it was so decentralized that they didn't so they were looking more i mean and they were a community of entrepreneurs they were looking at uh, so, some of them uh, just at their city you know somebody from uh, Clues, you know, they're trying to fix the city light or something like some things that are very close to them in a sense, and uh, that's why uh, we've started um, this community, uh, uh, you know, from zero, the the Bikres Hackathon, and we 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 put some other. Uh, so instead of like creating entrepreneur, like doing entrepreneurship, we said, you know, we want to bring together technologies who want to dream the future and who want to to explore the future. So a different type of uh, people came uh around that idea and uh, that's another community that we are developing with people who want to use the latest technologies to develop the future and because blockchain is one of the late you know it was chat gpt and the others uh, the other new technologies but uh be because of that there's another community you know so the communities i think are under a guiding light and uh, and here i think you know it's a community of you know smart people that want to discuss things together so that's why probably it's not necessarily just blockchain or just so you know the, and it's it's interesting to see how communities uh, appear and how they develop and sometimes it's, it's about a place i mean like rigore was saying they, he wants to turn this place into like a space for like have a culture have like a community it could be the community of this place uh, and this is this is amazing i mean um, uh, communities are in my opinion i mean in my opinion we as uh, individuals we learn from others and uh, and uh, I think that we uh, have to continue to learn, no matter what age we have. Uh, and uh, the best way to learn, for me at least, is from younger people most of the time. So that's why I'm uh, I'm still reaching out to the new waves of students to create communities with them in order to get inspired by their thoughts and by their their, their new way of thinking. Right. So yeah, that's my thought about communities. I'm happy to be in this community, by the way. Yeah, I, I don't think much of community. <laughs> um, I just do what I think is interesting. And uh, I happen to be very lucky to work with very smart students and very smart people in general. And, you know, have a common or, you know, <laughs> same like uh, system of values. Uh, but one thing I noticed is that blockchain or cryptocurrency people uh, from across different cultures or different religions they 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 feel connected um you meet people you know from you say i have nothing to talk to this person um, about but then suddenly you talk about blockchain and you feel connected i think that's kind of interesting probably you know you go through a certain thinking process <laughs> To get to believe in this that makes you on the same wavelength with the other person i don't know that's that's uh, something interesting but i think we should also save some time for um for, the, for, for questions right do we have time yeah. okay um communities in blockchain well um one of the i mean in the web space i've met one of the most smartest people I ever met, but also one of the worst people I ever met. The rock <laughs> the rock <laughs> some people are the just bad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, some people are just bad. So that's. Uh, I mean, me being in a tech field for some for so long, and I started like very very young and so on and so forth. I I, I didn't have. I mean, I didn't have a hard life in in, in sort of like in. I, I'm not living in a country where like everything is like, uh, I mean, in a, maybe in a country where uh, criminality is like very high and so on and so forth. So I, I didn't, when, I, I, 
I didn't go through, I don't know, bad experiences. Okay, I had my bullies when I was the little and blah, 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 but that's another, another thing, right? And I, I, had, I didn't have a hard time, a hard life, sorry. Well, when I entered in Web3, <laughs> I start to see the other face of the world, right? Like where actually bad things happen in sort of like people putting actually real bounties for other people's head and so on and so forth because they lost money and they was actually like real, not a joke. Uh, so that's a, that's the bad part of the community of the uh, uh, web tree, and that's because it's a it's a value asset. So therefore, where is value always will be some bad actors. But the other most, and why I'm still here, is I've met one of the best people ever. Uh, I, I worked with people that I didn't even know their name, the real name, and I worked with them for like a year. And then we were like, we were kind of like friends. And then when we actually met real life, it, it was a bit awkward, like, okay. So you are AI, I just love it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So it was like, very awkward, but it, it's amazing like how this community and it's actually a, 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 a cult, right? Because we are basically in a cult where everyone is uh, trying to, to, to build awesome stuff and uh, everyone that tries to uh, understand and uh, see where, where the future technology is going. Uh, I didn't meet a lot of people from Romania that are in the blockchain space. Thank God to everyone multiverse that they bought, let's say, blockchain into the mm -hmm. Romanians thinking. So I've met people that um, uh, are talking about blockchain because of Aaron, and that's a very good. The other, other good things, but that's one of the good things. I didn't meet a lot of people in Romania, and I already had a hard time to engage in the conversation, and I'm really glad that I'm here. It seems here seems to be like very smart. Um, um, very smart people, but yeah. Um, so yeah, communities. We need more communities, and we need uh, in, in Web three again. It's a very nice community and very uh, a, a community full of smart people, but can be also a community of full of bad people. So you need to watch out. Uh, yeah, I, I was lucky enough not to uh, encounter such evil, evil people. Although I do get a lot of uh, a lot of scammers on Telegram, I think that's part of being on a blockchain. You get used to to, to being, you know, send messages from scammers every day. Um, I will talk a little bit about the, what I've seen in the Multiverse X community about the people around us. Uh, I was thinking while we were talking. I think I could classify like four kinds of people like in the community. It's like the general enthusiasts who just love the tech, but they're not technical. Uh, they're just enthusiastic. There's the traders, they're usually very emotional. Uh, they're very passionate. Um, some of them really know what they do. Many of them don't know they're gambling, but yeah, there, there's that. I try to tell them sometimes, but uh, I think there's the NFT community, which is sort of interesting because they're not quite so technical, but they're a bit technical and maybe sometimes more artistically inclined. Some of them are also rock pullers. So it's, it's a diverse bunch. And then you have like developers and people who really are a bit technical and they're usually the fewest, unfortunately, but I guess it, you couldn't have them without all the other you know, kinds of people. Uh, and what you feel across all these kinds of communities, they all have a lot of enthusiasm. It's also probably because it's a very difficult technology. So unless you're very enthusiastic, uh, you know, you're probably not going to be in the space. So it, it selects people who are, who are really enthusiastic. And yeah, there's also a lot of emotion when there's so when people talk about value and values, you know. Um, so I think it's important that we have all these kinds of communities. And I, I'm actually thinking, how can we bring blockchain? When I think of NFTs, you know, NFTs, yeah, they have value. Some of them have value, some of them don't. Uh, so you can think think of it sometimes like a gamification of blockchain. People people play with these things and they have fun with these things. And through that, they they learn about the blockchain in an active way. And we should probably find more things like NFTs, you know, to draw people to play and to have fun. So, yeah, I think I think that's the most important thing with communities is the, like the energy and keeping the energy going, and then the people's having the people having fun. So, I think that's how the communities grow. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now back to the community. So now uh, let's, let's see what. Uh, we... 
proud uh, wisdom. Any, any questions? Um, okay, I have a question. Uh, so, um, Grigore, you said earlier that um, the blockchain technology is not yet mass adopted and people are still looking at banks and using them. Uh, a question would be, do you think that the, and I think it's addressed to all of you, do you think that the blockchain space and technology is mature enough and has developed en enough to be mass adopted by everyone? Um, I don't know. I'd like to think that yes. You know, I'd like to buy things directly on the blockchain. If I want your motorcycle, I want to just send you USDC if you want a stable coin and just get a motorbike right? without any intermediary, without anything. And I think for that kind, I mean, Modulo, the rug pullers and, <laughs> and scammers, I think yes, <laughs> the answer is yes, right? Uh, but maybe it's safe to wait a few more years until uh, things get a bit more mainstreamed and also until, um, you know, maybe the next generation grows up <laughs> and they get, um, you know, to change the world uh, their way, right? Because our parents, my parents, and even my generation, you know, we're already old, right? So it's hard to hard to change. I mean, I have very good friends who are who are hard to change. You know, they they think that this is all a crap. It has no value, and um, you know, they 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 want to be able to blame somebody if they lose their key, the private key. They they want to go and knock at some door, show their ID. <laughs> it's me. I want my money back. You know, so you do a centralized system. Yeah. You use a centralized system. Right. For them. Yeah. Yeah. If you find one, <laughs> which is safe. Right. Um, but yeah, so I don't know. I, I, I would use it. Okay. So I don't feel the need to use a bank. And each time when I use it, I hate it. So that's, that's my opinion about banks. There's a there is a use case. So when I you know when I looked in deeper into the financial ecosystem, there is a reason to be for commercial banks. Uh, they have a license to print money in order to give loans to individuals. So if you so if you want to you know you, you have to build all of these you know lending protocols on top of the national bank in order to get rid of the commercial banks, which is it's possible. It's very possible. It's it, but it's possible. I mean, uh, so that's. True. But uh, what I wanted to say is that with uh, Elrond, at least in Romania, um, a lot of the people that I interact with in services. I mean, my hairdresser and uh, my uh, kinetotherapist and uh, like everybody had uh, Mayar, you know, before. So everybody had Mayar and they had uh, they had EGLD. And uh, they not all their money, but they were looking at it as uh, something uh, good to invest, and they had the app. Uh, so when, when and when I heard that, I mean, because initially it was between us, you know. Initially, I you know spoke with Benny and with like with the guys. Initially, uh, nothing was happening, and then it was launched, but only you know a few people had it. But after the app was launched, normal people, a lot of normal people had the app. And asked me about uh, you know. So that's a that's if they have and now they have a portion of their money in that, and the rest maybe. I don't think they have a lot in bank because these, these are not people who make a lot of money. They don't have a, a huge income, so they have a portion. So maybe half of their money is uh, in Elrond, and maybe half in a bank. You know, in five years, I mean, you know, and you know after uh, the card is launched and. Uh, yeah, so uh, not sure how do you define like his, um, what mature enough means. Uh, with most of people that I speak about blockchain and crypto, uh, they all say, oh, yeah, yeah, crypto was built to laundry money and to scam and to blah, blah, blah. Well, a Chainalysis report 2021 showed that under 1% of the like actually bad money that have moved around the world are happening on blockchain. The rest are still happening on our traditional banks. Uh, not a huge adoption also with the exactly, exactly, exactly. So not a huge adoption there as well. Uh, 
Why? Because it's public. That's the problem, <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> exactly. Uh, but yeah, I don't see. I mean, of course, if we think of it like in a in 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 a story, we can think like okay, blockchain can replace all the banks and so on and so forth. But to be to be a, a bit. Uh, or at least not in our lifetime. I don't think that it will happen. The banks will still run everything. I mean, centralized entities still will still be here. But I would love to see that you at least have the option to choose on which one you are. Like, okay, I want to live and to actually pay with uh, USDC when I buy something and without actually doing anything. Uh, but I can also like, uh if i if i want i can buy with i i don't know fiat money right but i i want to have the opportunity to choose which one i want to use because it, as as my colleague here said that it's a very big responsibility to deal with your own money uh, uh and to actually be the one who if you lose those keys you basically lose your your money i mean it's not like you can call someone to to give give you back so it's a big responsibility, but I would love to have the possibility to, uh, and I, I think it's possible uh, over time to have the possibility to choose to go full blockchain or not, and to not be uh, considered like something. Ah, okay, this is not, uh, this is just a rug pull. Don't. This is not a thing that we should invest into. Uh, yeah. So on the topic of banks. Um... I, I some I, I'm not sure a lot of people are aware, but in a way, banks already run sort of on a blockchain. Like the SEPA system is, for practical reasons, is practically like a very permission centralized, but still sort of like a blockchain. It's there's no, yeah, Swift and yeah. So yeah, yeah. Have, you know, like a ledger where they can put an NFT. Yeah. So, like the old ATC or like all the things that you came back. Yeah. You can, you can like to have a deposit, they deposit box. You have, you can put also your NFT on their Yeah. So they, so they adopt the bank adopted blockchain. And like even for even even like not for public, but for between the banks when they do transfers, when they settle stuff like that, there's a strong use phase use case for blockchain there it's probably cheaper than what they use nowadays which is very old technology anyway so uh and yeah i also don't i don't think banks are going away too soon i think there's there's a place for them uh but yeah it, it also would be nice for people to have ac direct access to the public infrastructure and uh regarding you know uh, <laughs> Uh, and regarding like the market and how people react to products like Xportal, you know, Mayar, I feel uh, in the society there's a very strong like emotional reaction to whether it's bull market or bear market. Right now we're in a bear market and barely anybody talks about crypto. Uh, but like half a year or a year ago when it was bull market, it was on everybody's minds. Um, for us, I, I get asked a lot how it is to develop during the bear market. Uh, and I'm like, well, for us, it's the same because we don't care so much. But we notice this a lot around us. And actually, a lot of projects, there, there's this saying in blockchain that it's usually be better to launch during bear market because uh, usually you have more, there's often more successful launches because the hype is not so big. So it can scale up a bit easier. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I, I like bull markets, but I think bear markets are also great to develop. Uh, and even though people don't talk so much about um, blockchain all of the time especially when it's bear market nobody cares about it once it's on the news it's bull market everybody goes crazy i think that's normal but we shouldn't get sidetracked with that and actually the fact that people install their application once like we have a million i think or two uh, users on x portal the fact that they installed it once it's big a big deal because they will remember they they will they will find it familiar and I actually also think we had a lot of like steps towards it. The fact that we have Revolut, for instance, is so popular in Romania, I think is a great deal because it got people used to having money on their cell phones. Uh, and the fact that we use cards to pay so much and not so much cash, which is, by the way, it doesn't happen everywhere in the world, even like in Western Europe, there's a lot of places where you can't pay by card. Uh, Romania is more like the exception. 
uh, I think it got people used to the idea that that money is is abstract, is digital. It's it's okay to have it here, and I think it brings them closer to to accepting the idea of uh, blockchain in their lives. Yeah, thanks. Other questions? Other questions? Yeah. Uh, So the, there was this idea, I think Rigore said it, that uh, people should be educated to uh, to use blockchain. So there are a lot of blockchain experts here. What should we do? What should they do to educate more people towards uh, understanding blockchain and towards using blockchain? Can I take a stab? I mean, uh, I, I think we, uh, I, I, have a very, I have a strong opinion about it. I don't think that the experts should educate the masses. I think you have to, we have to find the educators, the one who can educate actually, because sometimes, and uh, this is from my personal experience, having been uh, at Olympiads with uh, Grigore, uh, me trying to explain a, a math problem to my daughters failed miserably, because to me it was obvious. I mean, I didn't know what to explain. It's like, it's very clear how to do that, I mean, right? So when you're an expert at something, very often you are unable to explain it. And I, I have a friend, a very good friend, dear friend of mine, uh, who uh, was an athlete. He struggled with math in, in school. So he, he, he really learned math the hard way, right? And now he's a math teacher. And he's doing very well at that because it took him a lot of time to understand math. Now he's, very, he's able to explain that to, like, to regular because now we're not talking about academics. Of course, that experts, you know, like academics have to explain to students. I mean, that's another level. But if, if we're talking about the masses, we need to find the good educators who are able to them themselves. So we, like as experts, we have to train the educators, and they have to translate that to 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 everybody else. In my opinion, where we find the educators. And actually, actually, at DevCon this year, I met two people who were educators in blockchain. I asked them, "What do you do?" Oh, we are educators. We educate people to use blockchain. Said what? I mean, can't you do anything more interesting? <laughs> like write some code or something. But um, yeah, then talking to them, I realized, and, and and one of them was specialized on crypto techniques, crypto, how to explain cryptography to normal people, right? And uh, it's nothing that uh, we can click at. <laughs> so we hear that, what, why that way? Yeah, and um, and I also saw it in uh, my own company. Right, so I had a hard time explaining people what K is, um, matching logic. You know why this and even people who are trained mathematically. I lost my patience. Uh, what the heck do you mean? You know what's the right rule? <laughs> <laughs> and then we hired people in the company who are very talented. You know, at explaining things, and um, I listened to them. I said, "Wow, that's a very good explanation." Even. Hmm, actually, I understand this thing better myself. <laughs> I heard this guy talking about it. <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, and then the best thing that can happen is to see other people you have no idea who they are. You know, talking about the things that, um, you know, not necessarily you, but, you know, groups that you work with, explaining to others, right? Then when you are not even needed to explain these things. I think that's when, when the mass adoption happens. You know, when, when other people talk about technically, you know, intricate things to others. And, uh, you know, and uh, you don't need actually the experts at all to explain things. I think that's, that's when it happens. And, and I, have a, I have a personal story to, to, to share. Uh, I, I, I was, maybe still am, but I was a, an expert in operating systems and uh, I started to teach them at the university. And in the, in the first years, I found that nobody would understand what I would say. So uh, how, because I, I was like, you know, too expert at that. I didn't know how to explain. So what I've done was like, you know, in a, in a room of like a hundred people, I asked them who, who understands what I'm saying and like five hands maybe, right? So, so like, come here, explain them to, to them, right? So then they learned because they, they understood what their peers explained to them. And I also learned how to explain to their peers and what, what are the missing, uh, links that I didn't realize they're missing from my explanations. So, uh, yeah, so I mean, so, so then, I mean, in this case, even the experts can explain something to, to a lot of people if, if they try to explain, <laughs> ask who understands and then use them, put them 
front and center to explain all the others. For example, Leo, you are a strong logician and mathematician, right? But I think you are incapable to explain induction, okay, to beginners. <laughs> it's very hard, right? But, uh, you know, uh, a high school teacher found their way already to do it. New X fee. <laughs> More questions. Uh, just, just one thing I wanted to say. So for me, explaining to people, uh, I trained on my wife. So uh, that's also a way to do it. Yeah, and I was terrible at first. Yeah. Absolutely terrible at first. Got her so frustrated. But, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it helped. It helped. I can explain a bit better now, though. Still not good, but. <laughs> Uh, in a limited sense yeah <laughs> okay so we had a question from the online audience saying that what is the perspective over digital bureaucracy how would it, how would it be for example that the purchase of a house be done on the blockchain is it fa feasible does it sound like an idea to be implemented in the near future they are right now with, they are oh sorry i'm talking to that <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, they are called security tokens. It happens right now, but it's a bit uh, of a hurdle to actually bring it to uh, mass adoption as as always. Um, I mean, I've talked with people who like who work in actually in the let's see, in the houses industries and they buy and so on and so forth, and they all are, or uh, they all ask me like, "But well, how can we bring blockchain? I mean, how can I sell a house on a blockchain, right?" Uh, I know. I mean, how exactly can I tell that the owner it's him or right? I say, wait, that's a security token. I mean, that it's a physical asset that it's basically port ported into the blockchain. It's like like an NFT gives you the right of that image. Uh, that NFT that because NFT is actually a standard can tell you that you are the right owner to that uh, house. But, but when today, I mean, there are notaries who accept uh, transactions using Bitcoin, for instance. In Romania right now, you can pay with Bitcoin, but the, the, the property right to be on blockchain, uh, I think that is uh, akin in a sense to, you know, to banks. I mean, uh, it's like, you know, what, what th this is to notaries, what, uh, let's say, crypto lending is to banks. So, uh, it you know, with, with, with the real world, I, I think that, right you'll have to you know fight the notaries and somehow fight the the whole culture of having a paper in a drawer somewhere i mean which is uh, the basis of the notarial act actually put the house on the blockchain not you can put your own house on the blockchain it's already on the notary chain so how do you link that to you know i mean it's already i mean when a house gets created then it's on a that you have to register it that there is an entity that exists already so how to bridge that to the blockchain i think is the question and it's unfortunately a question for the regulators and i don't think they know the answer so so it's happening um we audited um a smart contract complex actually collection of smart contracts by a company and uh, i'm not sure i can mention them yet so um I can tell you only the story. And um, what they want to do is exactly that, basically to associate NFTs to, uh, to assets of unique identity, houses, cars, paintings, whatever. And, um, and then to have a market for those uh, where you can actually use, for example, your house as an NFT as collateral to make a loan and buy a car make a down payment for a car and, um, you know, and so on and so forth. So whatever you do in real life, going through a very complex and heavy bureaucratic mechanism, right, can be done with smart contracts immediately, the same way you use Bitcoin or Ethereum as collateral and, and loan USDC and then buy a car. Uh, same way you can use assets from the real world. And their challenge was, well, a technical challenge, how to make sure the code is correct. And then the other one is how to keep the mapping between the real world assets and the digital version of them. But this is a company, they are like 50 people and they work on that, right, in the United States. 
Um, so it's happening. Okay, so out of the fifteen minutes, so I would uh, maybe we can finish here with a, a lot, a couple of uh, final thoughts from the panelists. And we can have and we can have you afterwards for the dinner. I think we should keep up. Oh, question? Maybe a question. Yeah, yeah maybe a question. Maybe a question. Yes. Yes. Like final, final thought over wine. Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. After a the bottle of wine. I was thinking that maybe one big hurdle option of cryptocurrency is the big volatility. And it, I think it, it has nothing to do with technology. It's more like, I don't know. Uh, so is this problem being addressed or how do you think about this problem? Like to, to make uh, the currency more stable so it's much more appealing to people. I personally <laughs> didn't buy a currency because maybe for me it's a big issue personally. I think the Tesla stock was more volatile than Bitcoin. Yeah, I didn't buy it all this time. <laughs> right. So that that happening with all resources that people want, and they are not in high demand. That that happens. Uh, and I'm, I'm not concerned actually. About I I I think that we're talking about mass adoption in the sense that the stock exchange is mass adopted everywhere, but people choose not to invest in the stock exchange. But everybody knows what it is, right? Everybody. M mass adoption means that uh, I think that everybody knows about stock exchange, about bursa, about uh, having st no stock like like Tesla or Google or like uh, Banca Transilvania or like having stock, stock exchange, stock uh, bursa, bursa. Deci, acțiuni la bursa. Toată lumea știe ce sunt acțiuni la bursa. Adică everybody knows what acțiuni la bursa mean and uh, no, no. But so it's mass adoption. I mean, it exists in the society. Everybody knows about it. Everybody can do that. They understand how to do it. There are brokers, but not everybody does that because they're as volatile as crypto. Crypto is not crypto is not at that level as as the stocks. Not everybody knows about crypto yet, and not it's not embraced as as, as stocks are already. Uh, Not necessarily. With the, no, with the, with the exception, <laughs> with the with the exception of USDC a few days ago. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I if you think of uh, Ethereum as a stock, and you think of Tesla as a stock, and you look at them, you see that they're very closely connected. <laughs> yeah. I heard like um, a lot of podcasts and people, smart people talking about this, like how do you think about, I mean, can Ethereum or Bitcoin ever be considered a, a currency? Like, okay, well, he said that I already think it's a currency for me. Why? Because I everything I buy, I transform it very quick in Bitcoin. Like how does, uh, how much does this mean in Bitcoin? Uh, I'm not sure if we can actually solve the volatile uh, problem because, again, an asset is worth something in dollars, and we uh, we cannot change that for now. And I'm not sure if we can in the future change, have this paradigm shift from fiat to completely going into the uh, into the let's say bit or Bitcoin or whatever you can call it. Like I'm not sure if we can actually. But but now volatility of uh, of uh, currencies is very similar to volatility of stocks because it because they got mass, mass adopted by big funds. So we had big investment funds that were investing in stocks before, like a few years ago. And since a few years, they are investing in uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and all of that, all of the others. So right now, if you look at uh, at the variances, you'll see sometimes the stocks, like pension stocks, like they, they're selling or they're buying. When they do that, they do that with uh, with action and with, uh, with with so so now now the volatility is very similar. So investment funds see Bitcoin and Ethereum as uh, stocks action. They don't see as currency. Bogdan. We we. 
be, be, yeah, because we, I, I think that uh, we, we're shying away from calling them stock because then if we call them stock, then the regulators will leg, regulate them as the stock market. So everybody will have to go through a lengthy process to do an IPO or something. So it's, it's yeah, it's, uh, they are behaving like stocks because investment funds see them as being stocks, as being an asset class rather than a currency. Also be a commodity. Or a commodity, or, or like gold. gold. Now we have, we have some people, some Bitcoiners, firm believers, <laughs> uh, they say that the Bitcoin is, you know, it's stable. One Bitcoin is one Bitcoin. Uh, the dollar, the dollar is very volatile. <laughs> If you think again as being uh, everything that you buy or whatever it's in Bitcoin and not in USD, then it's a currency already for you. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like mass adoption and like everyone changes to, I mean, if we look at Romania, we should have Euro as a currency right today. We, I, we are way we past that. To yeah, maybe we go directly <laughs> to Bitcoin and that's <laughs> Yeah. Or a stable coin that will have on multi vertex. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Other question or anyone else? Uh, just, yeah, just just one thing. So one thing I like about stable coins it, is that it helps people conceptualize the fact that it's a difference between the value of the token and the underlying technology. Because you could have like sort of dollar on the blockchain. Um, that's a bit of a problem with Bitcoin because Bitcoin is also the coin and also the network. Um, and it isn't, there was another sort of answer to this that, you know, Bitcoin and, you know, cryptocurrencies in general are not just preserving value in time, but you can also bridge space. Like if you think of Bitcoin as a settlement layer, say I want to transfer some money on the other side of the globe. You know, if I go to Western Union or stuff like that, it takes a long time. It's very expensive, but I could in principle buy Bitcoin, send it. The other person on the other side sells the Bitcoin and you probably won't have time for the volatility to kick in in, I don't know, a few hours, how, how long it takes. So from that point of view, volatility that doesn't really matter because you're just transferring stuff around. Actually, I did that. I used to send money to my mother. I don't, I don't send it to my mother. I used to send like, like $1,000 per month. And, uh, and it cost me $25 to make a wire transfer with TV Bank. And she had to pay $35 for it to get the money. So I ended up paying 6%, right? Well, because it was only a thousand dollar, it would be the same amount if it's more, but a lot of money. And then I said, wait a minute. Uh, I, then I educated my niece, you know, how to, sorry, how to, how to swap e-gold <laughs> for, <laughs> for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, Ron. And we use the bank, uh, not bank, the exchange trade Sylvania. Right, so I created my mother um, uh, an, an, an Elrond uh, back then, an Elrond uh, account, and I taught my niece how to send. I, I sent my mother eagle, and then she sent it to Trey Sylvania. My niece converted it, okay, to and, and all this was a few seconds and nothing, you know, in money. The longest part of the whole thing was to transfer the money from Trey Sylvania to yeah. Bechere <laughs> again. You know, and not because of Trichilonia, but because of Bechere. Okay. But it was free at least, right? So I sent my mother money for free. And then I did that for several months. It's a very underrated use case because it's a very underrated use case. People don't think about it, but it's it's possibly the most useful, like now, you know, just sending money around. It's still expensive in the traditional world. It's also like sorry, because we, uh, we keep keeping talking about it, but it's also a very important thing for countries that don't have any uh a a nice financial system, uh, sorry, like Venezuela, Romania. Romania. <laughs> okay, le like uh, Venezuela, like ev or like Ukraine, when the when everything like uh, w w when shit hit the fan, 
a lot of the people were like leaving because they had basically their assets in crypto and not in banks so they 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 weren't like uh because the atms were like closed and so on and so forth so they were not they could pay with crypto and that was actually a, an asset uh so yeah it's used right now in some use cases but i'm not i'm not like uh mass adoption right everyone uses usdc from now on and that's it Yeah, but no one shied away from the vo volatility, uh, actually. I, I strongly disagree with that. I work with a lot of Cuban people who for some time did adopt crypto to try and fix this issue when they were, a lot of people lost a serious amount of money because mm -hmm. of volatility, but they were keeping it as their like day to day currency. And now there's been mass abandonment in Cuba, right? So it is an issue. I, I, I don't agree with that. It, uh, I mean, it is an issue and it will be an issue as people don't understand the technology and the risk. Sure, sure. I mean, look, how many people lose money in stocks? I mean, like, come on. Why yeah, uh, no one talks about that? The appropriate yeah. use case there would be physical transfer. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Assets exactly. and, exactly. and exactly. stable right. coins would be they more like. Uh, yeah, sure, yeah, sure, sure. There I agree. There I, agree. I mean, you take your one million and put it in Bitcoin when it's 60 and now it's 20 and now you. Sure. It's like stock, right? You put money in Tesla. Now Tesla is not that big, so. But yeah, there is. There is a yeah, exactly. But the that right? problem actually was the hype. It was not the technology yeah, itself. Yeah, the yeah, hype. Yeah. Oh, buy you, uh, and that's something I fight daily and daily. Like, don't buy the hype and don't try to get rich overnight. Because you, I mean, that though, I was millionaire in safe mode and I was broke because I sold everything. Right. <laughs> don't don't buy into that don't buy into that buy into the technology nothing to get in each overnight because those those times are like way gone actually actually we are i think we are kind of a blockchain company runtime verification and i think two-thirds of our people don't want to touch crypto and that drives me crazy. <laughs> try it. Try the protocol you are auditing at least to see why I don't need to try. But you've never made any transaction ever, and you audit this thing. Yeah, I don't need to. I still find bugs in them. I still find bugs in them. What's that? But you formally verified it, right? You don't actually need to execute the program. Exactly. Yep. Yep. I, I had like one last question if you guys had time for it because so we mentioned the question of adoption and one thing that no one mentioned which I think to me is one of the key questions is this the visa network processes a hundred thousand to a million transactions a second ethereum pro processes 10 to 20 transactions a second that, that's several orders of magnitude how will that be bridged how will that be solved yeah well, I, I mean, I know there are lots of approaches, but for you guys, what what do you think are are going to be the big approaches? I, I, I can let him... Okay, you're like... multiverse. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's really in my court because uh, that was you know that was the yeah zk as well, but uh, this was sort of the <laughs> this is this was sort of the problem that started that run. So how do you bridge the scalability stuff? So for us, the solution is sharding. Right simple you, you simply split the blockchain into multiple shards it's a very difficult task but we say we fixed it yeah uh there was a test true it was just simple uh, evil transfers but it could also work like that with for a free ICT. uh it was 52 shards i think it was the most that, that the guys managed and was around 260,000 uh, transactions per second the biggest problem was actually not running the blockchain the biggest problem was actually pumping that many transactions into the system that's more difficult than it seems um and another thing that we're actually working on, uh, we're probably going to have side chains. So the traditional sharding would be sort of a homogenous shards; they're all the same. Uh, whereas uh, side chains would be specialized uh, shards with s separate um, uh, properties. For instance, some could be private, some could have a shorter block time, stuff like that. Uh, 
So I, we think this is solvable or at least solved. Right now, we the, the biggest problems, not only for us, but also for less scalable blockchains is that they actually don't have enough transactions. Uh, they don't have enough adoption. So we're still way off from that. So, yeah. And on EVM, yeah, we should. I want to see a bit of the EVM part uh, on EVM, how it will happen. Uh, Rollups, ZK, uh, sharding at some point, uh, and technology improvement uh, for sure. It will. I mean, we don't have the, that problem yet. I mean, we don't have the problem. Oh, we don't. We had a problem in 2020, and then uh, Polygon happened, then uh, Optimism happened, then Arbitrum happened, then Binance Smart Chain happened, and Rockpool. Just one more thing. Actually, a bigger a bigger problem than than the throughput might be the block time. So for us, it's six seconds. If you go to pay to the uh, to the uh, to the shop, six seconds might be a bit uncomfortable. So you might, yeah, there might be solutions there too. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's all. That's all. I'm done. I'm done. Let's stop. Let's stop.